great automobile factories and the grounds encircling them are never empty. Like mighty reservoirs, they feed the streams of cars along the highways. A million families call for motor cars. The work of men who make them is always in demand. America has a ready purse and gives eager acceptance to what the men of motors have built and built well. Fine materials, soundly assembled. And while a restless and never satisfied horizon calls, the new automobiles stream from the factories, spreading pleasure and speeding business all across the country. The destination? Everywhere, USA. And now a stream of paychecks flows to all the men who are building a million cars for the boulevards and highways of America. Tens of thousands of men on one single payroll have money for themselves and for their families to spend. Money to spend for wholesome foods, for good clothes, money for comforts and conveniences. Fresh buying power floods into all the stores of every community. New trade and new commerce have been created by the overflow of purses. And beyond the marketplaces, new wealth flourishes and new prosperity grows. Prosperity greater than history has ever known.
You're watching Sleepcore. Pleasant dreams. such an outstanding material. The answer lies in its amazing versatility and unusual combination of properties. Its smart, modern appearance in a variety of natural or colored finishes. Its great strength combined with extreme light weight, an outstanding advantage in almost every metal application. Its high electrical conductivity, with aluminum leading all other metals in a pound for pound comparison. It's immunity to all kinds of weather without rust or corrosion. It's superior light and heat reflectivity, for aluminum brilliantly outshines all other uncoated metals. Aluminum excels most other metals in its ability to conduct heat quickly and evenly. amazing things about this most remarkable metal is its tremendous abundance as a raw material. In America, the richest of these commercial grade aluminum deposits are located in the central region of Arkansas. Although traces of aluminum may be found in almost any soil, only those clays containing 50 or 60 percent aluminum ore and known as bauxite are mined for commercial production. And here, one of the foremost producers of aluminum derives much of its ore for the reduction plants. In order to ensure a constant and uninterrupted supply of this raw material, Reynolds, some years ago, pioneered the development of extensive aluminum ore deposits in Haiti and Jamaica. These deposits, along with mining operations in British Guiana, constitute the world's largest known aluminum ore reserves, representing a vital backlog of strategic material for consumer goods and defense production. On the island of Jamaica alone, more than 50,000 acres are owned by Reynolds for the mining of aluminum ore. As the bauxite deposits are mined out, Reynolds resoils and restores the pits to crop, grazing, or forest land for the Jamaican's use. Mining of aluminum ore in Jamaica is primarily a huge earth-moving operation, and for the islanders, the mines have meant new jobs and a sounder economy. After leaving the mines, the aluminum ore travels on a breathtaking journey over six miles of aerial tramway to the sea.
At Ochos Rios Bay, the bauxite ore is loaded aboard a modern ore carrier for its trip to the mainland, where the next phase of its transformation to metal begins. Among this maze of giant digesters, settlers, and washers, all the skill and ingenuity of modern chemical engineering combine to provide the first step in unlocking aluminum from the earth. The chemical process reaches its climax in these huge tanks, where alumina is precipitated out of the ore in caustic solution. Later, the water content is driven off by baking in giant rotary kilns, resulting in this pure snow-white powder known as alumina. An ever-increasing amount of this alumina is being used in chemical processing, in soil conditioners, in abrasives, and many other applications. In order to reduce the alumina to solid aluminum, it is transferred to one of a number of reduction plants and converted to metallic form in giant electrolytic cells. These plants consume electrical power in tremendous quantities, enough to supply the daily needs of one million people. About one third of the required electricity is generated at Reynolds plants, and the rest is purchased from outside sources. Over 20,000 kilowatt hours of electricity will pass through the cell to produce one ton of aluminum. Some of the molten aluminum is transferred directly to a customer's adjacent foundry, where it is poured hot into the customer's holding furnace before casting. Back at the Reynolds plant, as the molten metal is cast, aluminum begins to take recognizable shape and form. the pigs are alloyed with small amounts of other metals to give them the right combination of properties. From the alloying furnace, aluminum now marches forth in the shape of ingots, blooms, and billets, each destined for a specific fabricating sequence. Producing 6,000 pound ingots into aluminum sheet requires giant machinery, plus great technical skill and experience. sheet is ready for shipment to thousands of fabricators who will reshape it into a hundred thousand useful things from washing machines to airplane wings. The fabricating service, as its name implies, is a service to manufacturers providing them with a great variety of blanked, formed, and precision finished parts ready for assembly.
one roof is found the most modern equipment. Many costly but necessary facilities, often beyond the reach of the average fabricator, are made available through this service, including press equipment capable of handling the largest aluminum draws ever made, plus a workforce of skilled specialists with long experience in high-speed precision fabrication. With imagination and daring, the fabricating service tackles the most difficult production assignments, such as this patented tubed sheet, a solid aluminum sheet with self-contained passages for liquid or gas. The tubed sheet is now in common use, as in this refrigeration unit, and has unlimited possibilities in all types of heat transfer applications. Still another contribution of the fabricating service are the all-aluminum truck and body parts assembled for the leading truck and trailer companies. Because aluminum will not rust, these parts will not need painting, and neither will these aluminum gutters and downspouts. Aluminum buildings are easily constructed, requiring a minimum amount of maintenance and upkeep. Self-insulating against both heat and cold, aluminum sheet provides greater protection for every type of outdoor use, from industrial buildings, large and small, to the most modern residents. Lightweight, strength, and the versatility of aluminum make possible higher payloads in all commercial vehicles, from highway trailers to modern smart-looking delivery trucks. Aluminum adds beauty and flexibility of design to lightweight highway homes and ultra-modern buses. In national defense, as in many other fields, aluminum is everywhere. In the air, on the ground, and on the sea, versatile aluminum serves our fighting men. In today's architecture, aluminum has become synonymous with modern design not only in new buildings, but to facelift dingy old exteriors and transform them into colorful new fronts in tune with the times. The use of aluminum is equally effective inside as well as out. From table lamp to acoustical ceiling, aluminum contributes that decorative modern touch to office and home. Because aluminum reflects up to 95% of all radiant heat and effectively stops moisture, it finds extensive use in all types of insulation. These same reflective qualities add extra efficiency to aluminum heating and air conditioning ducts. You're watching Sleepcore, media for insomnia. You've heard of the golden horn of plenty traditional symbol of prosperity and of good things bestowed upon mankind. Well, these are the wheels which carry the horn of plenty. Wheels which take it to the places where the good things abound and bring it back full and overflowing. We take our American comforts and conveniences pretty much for granted. In our homes, we are surrounded by 20th century miracles. Miracles which are not exclusively American, but which are here so commonplace that they are seldom regarded as miracles anymore. Dinner's ready. Come and get it. Hey, that's for me. Let me at it. Mmm, gravy and lots of it. Jimmy, wait till everyone is served. Yes, Jimmy. We'll have some manners here, if you don't mind. Jimmy ain't got no manners. Jimmy have it. Any manners. All right, any manners. Oh, uh, Jimmy, we forgot your food prayer. Yes, sir. Lord, we thank you for that food and thy loving care. Amen. Yes, it's all pretty commonplace in America, isn't it? The comfortable homes we live in, the cars parked at the door, the bikes and mechanical gadgets of all kinds, schools where every child has a right to expect an education. Satisfying recreation for everybody. Leisure time in which to enjoy it. Americans, you are in luck. Of course, you've worked for it. 
You've made the land hum with the song of your toil. But people in other lands and in other times have worked too, worked hard to eke out a mere existence. Why have we been so remarkably successful at it? Why have we been able to make this land of ours so productive? Nature's been pretty lavish, of course. We've lived under a governmental system, the first on earth to make each man the captain of his soul. We've had enterprise, our great inheritance from ambitious and freedom-loving forebears. All these are parts of the American mural parts of the reason for our golden horn of plenty. But look further. Why a car like this that a man of average means can afford to own? If every American had to build his own automobile with materials of his own gathering and with tools of his own contriving, there would be very few automobiles in the land. Where would an individual get the steel to mold into this beautiful looking body? Where are the vast presses to shape it? Where is the raw rubber to make these tires, the tough fabric to weave with it? These things are as widely scattered as the four winds, or they were until wheels brought them together. The magic of our modern horn of plenty is the magic of mobility. The magic of the greatest interchange of goods and of services which the world has ever known. Take the farm machinery which helps to make our soil the most productive on earth. This tractor contains quantities of steel which came from the iron ore of the Mesabi Range in northern Minnesota. That ore came hundreds of miles by rail and by boat to the mills along the fringes of the Great Lakes. It was refined with the use of coal and limestone and other elements which were brought great distances. Hundreds of types of raw materials and of semi-finished materials and fabricated parts have to be brought together into a single factory before such a complex mechanism as a tractor or a reaper or a threshing machine can be put together. Each great factory, such as this, makes use of countless carloads of materials during the course of a year. Turns out thousands upon thousands of pieces of machinery. Machinery which is sent to every corner of America, and to the four corners of the world, for that matter, where farmers need it to till the soil efficiently. Machinery sent at a price which nearly every farmer can afford, because it is manufactured by the American mass production method the method which mass transportation made possible. The variety of raw materials which we make use of in our modern civilization is seemingly limitless, and the great quantities of them which have to be shipped over vast distances are almost beyond belief. Consider the billions upon billions of bushels of grain which are grown in America every year. Wheat, corn, rice, barley, oats, grains which are the staff of life. These billions of bushels have to be transported to elevators, stored until they are required by processing plants, shipped and reshipped until they have been made into flour and bread and breakfast food and delivered to your hometown, your store, your pantry shelf. Livestock, millions of head marketed in an average year. Transported, many of them, several times before they reach their final destination, your dining room table. Transported to feeding areas, to stockyards, to processing plants. Then, as meat in refrigerator cars, to your butcher's cooler and thence to you. Products of the forest, billions of board feet of lumber a year. Lumber brought to the mill as giant logs sawed into all shapes and sizes, delivered to the thousands of factories which make products out of wood, set down in your front yard as building material, or in your living room as furniture. Countless products to enrich your living. Products of the mine, many of them seldom thought of by the average American in the gigantic quantities which are produced and consumed each year. Products like sulfur and salt, as well as steel and aluminum and lead and coal and copper. Products moving, 
always moving so that they may be put to your service. Oil, the black gold of our machine age. Oil to lubricate your car, to heat your home, to drive the wheels of industry. Oil to make gasoline and kerosene, synthetic rubber, useful products almost innumerable. Oil which must be transported before it can be of any use to most people. Things which are brought from distant lands across the sea. Coffee and tea. Tin and rubber, spices and silk. Things in never-ending succession which we bring in from the four corners of the earth. Things which we send abroad in exchange for the items we import. Cotton and grain, minerals machinery and fabricated items of every description. This great movement pattern, which is the foundation of our 20th century prosperity, is symbolized by the ingenious machines which man has created, especially here in America, to keep goods moving. The giants of the rails, the trucks for coordinated rail truck service, the huge ships and the vast facilities for interchange between one method of transport and another. One recent development makes possible the shipment of a hundred or more loaded freight cars on a specially constructed boat called a sea train. This spectacular and useful device eliminates the necessity of loading and reloading from car to boat and back again at port cities. Entire freight cars are picked up by the giant machinery stored on tracks within the hold of the ship until they are removed by similar machinery at their port of destination. Here, the cars are again placed on rails and speeded to their final unloading points. Another example of the American inventive mind and business enterprise working to provide America with the greatest transportation system in the world. The backbone of this transportation system is the railroad. The experience of a century during which mass transportation has helped to change the face of the nation has proven beyond a doubt that the great bulk of the nation's goods can be moved more efficiently, more swiftly, more dependably on rails than it can by any other system of transport ever devised. The significance of railroads will increase in the years ahead. American business is growing by leaps and bounds. Railroads are almost the only form of mass transportation which can offer an important reserve of hauling capacity to meet the growing demands of American industry and commerce. Railroads have been building for the future. During the past few years, billions of dollars have been spent on America's rail lines. The Rock Island lines have been in the forefront of this building program. During the past decade, this railroad has rebuilt and modernized plant and structure more thoroughly than most of the nation's major lines. This program of planned progress has placed the Rock Island in position to give a service to shippers and travelers which is unsurpassed. Rock Island occupies a strategic position on the railroad map of the nation. Its lines serve 14 of the most productive and diversified states in the Union. 8,000 miles of modern steel rails are in its network. This is a fabulous empire, this Rock Island wonderland, which stretches westward from Chicago, St. Louis, and Memphis to the mountains of the west and through its friendly connections onto the Pacific coast. It reaches from the twin cities of the North Star State to the Gulf ports of Houston, Texas City, and Galveston of the Lone Star State. It is an empire dotted with great and growing cities where much of the nation's business is done. It is an empire of prairie vastnesses and of broad, rich valleys where growing things abound. It is an empire of progress and opportunity unsurpassed. Since 1852, the Rock Island has been helping industry to grow and expand in this area. There are still hundreds and hundreds of available industrial sites which offer the finest advantages of good transportation adequate power supply, and skilled labor. Throughout that empire, the Rock Island now operates one of the finest railroads in the world. Heavy steel rail, superbly laid and ballasted, makes it a truly velvet highway. But it is a tough highway, too. 
able to take the punishing weight of thousands of tons of freight speeding along at mile a minute clip. Modern bridges have been built to handle these tremendous loads. Spectacular in Rock Island's bridge program is this great structure over the Cimarron in western Kansas. Its building was one of the outstanding feats of railroading. Its construction, together with track relocation, grade elimination, and curve reduction, aided greatly in speeding up transcontinental freight and passenger schedules, thus making Rock Island the preferred route between east and west. All Rock Island main lines are genuine speedways. Curves and grades have been reduced to a minimum. Over these super highways of steel, rocket freights and rocket passenger trains travel with speed, with safety, with dependability, far in excess of anything mass transportation knew a few short years ago. Improvements in motive power, of course, have been spectacular. The modern diesel-electric locomotive, adopted by the Rock Island shortly after its first introduction, has all but replaced the old iron horse. Along with improved steam locomotives, which still have their place on modern railroads, diesels give the Rock Island the capacity to move tremendous quantities of the nation's goods with a dispatch which is truly revolutionary. A vast fleet of new and of continually reconditioned freight cars of all types is part of the equipment reservoir of the modern Rock Island. The most modern devices for traffic control ensure the swift, safe, and dependable movement of Rock Island trains. On the busiest sections of the line, centralized traffic control is in operation. This system eliminates countless delays in the dispatching of trains enabling one man to see at a glance and to control the movement of all trains in his control area. A movement of a hand, and he has thrown electrically a switch which may be many miles distant from him. This enables a train to take another track without delay. Centralized traffic control actually makes one track do the work of two, two tracks the work of four. It assures a continuous maximum flow of traffic in either direction with the utmost of safety. You're watching Sleepcore. Sleep tight.
The nation's history is far more a record of imperial victory than a saga of wars waged and battles won. Its greatness lies in glowing furnaces and smoking stacks, in skilled labor, inventive genius, and the spirit of enterprise that is so typical of America. And typical of the steel industry, literally the backbone of a thousand industries, is the panorama that reveals the magnitude of any one of the major mills where the manufacture of steel involves a tremendous investment. Here, before a worker can be given a job, the company by which he is employed has an average of more than $11,000 for each man employed, and that does not include wages. Incidentally, Note one unusual feature of this industrial scene, which would not be found in any other country in the world. The automobiles are all work in the mills, men who are now age rate right in the history of the industry. Into such a center of activity, the raw materials are poured from train and ship. Thousands of tons of coal for the blast furnaces, mountains of iron ore, and vast quantities of limestone. They are charging a furnace or from which the iron is to be melted. Coke, to provide an intense heat in the base of the furnace as a superheated air blast passes through it. Limestone, to flux the impurities from the ore. Up to the top goes the laden larry to feed one of these giants that may eat up as much as 3,000 tons of solid raw materials a day. Now they are preparing to tap a furnace at the base where they may draw off as much as a hundred tons of molten iron at a time. An oxygen torch burns into a clay plugged hole, but no chance for injury on this job. That asbestos suit and helmet would protect the any stray sparks or spatters. A thin stream of metal begins to flow, glowing liquid iron. The stream swells in volume, a fiery river if you ever saw one. But you, as an uninitiated onlooker, could not be expected to know that these men in charge are very much in command. With modern mechanical devices and highly developed safety measures that enable them to control the flowing metal with less danger to themselves than you face every day in your home or on the street. Today, the American steel mill is as safe a place to work as any industrial establishment. In fact, Company after company has prided itself on winning safety trophies, which stand for a prolonged period without a single serious accident. A sample of the metal will be cast into a small block and cooled for a quick analysis by the metallurgical laboratory to check its quality. Meanwhile, the flaming river is directed through channels which lead to the edge of the tapping floor, where it spills into huge ladles resting on flat cars. Ladle after ladle is filled, until finally, the laden train is on its way across the yard to its destination, the steel making departments, where the molten iron in the ladles will be poured into a large container called a mixer, holding many tons, and here kept hot, so that it can be used in its molten state in one of the three major processes in making steel. Of these, the Bessemer converter process is the oldest for producing a tonnage product available at low cost for a multitude of uses. Here stand the operators in safety behind shatterproof glass. Number three is going to pour. One of the monsters, like a huge egg with a top sliced off, tips over on its trunnions and pours into a ladle its load of steel that glows like the sunset and shoots millions of sparks through the dim traceries of girders and all down the length of the arena. Very different from the spectacular Bessemer is the squat little electric furnace which makes special steels because of its smaller capacity and the ease with which it can be controlled so accurately. From this process come the high-grade alloy steels such as stainless and all sorts of special steels with special qualities. And then there are the open hearths. While the roaring flame and fireworks from Bessemer converters still provide a thrilling spectacle, and capacity for producing steel in the electric furnace has been increasing in the last few years, 90% of steel today is produced in open hearth furnaces because of the demand for tailor-made steels in large quantities, which can be produced with this flexible and efficient method. And by the way, there is one interesting factor in the making of steel 
just as important as the virgin iron fresh from ore smelted in the blast furnace. It is scrap. Most of the scrap metal will be found en route to the open hearth department. Remelted scrap steel constituting about 50% of the total steel produced today. There's a carload of sheared ends. There's another. And there's a car that may hold all that is left of your 1929 automobile, now on its way to become part of a steel, and a better steel, perhaps for your next car. In this huge structure, the open hearth floor, which is typical of American steel mills, a long line of furnaces holds steel in the making. Steel that will someday enter your life, perhaps carry you safely on some journey, provide you with shelter, create an endless variety of comforts and conveniences. A supply of finely ground dolomite has been piled before the furnace that is to be charged. It will melt like glass and fill any holes that may have been burned through the lining by the previous heat, forming a solid bottom for the fresh charge. Then the charging begins. From the train load of scrap which has been brought close to the furnace, an electric charging machine lifts box after box and pushes its burden through the door of the furnace. The operator sitting at a safe distance, spinning the ram and dumping its load. There is the rumble of a giant traveling crane overhead, moving in with its burden. A huge ladle of molten iron from the mixer, where it has been awaiting this final step in the process of becoming steel. They are placing the chute into position for pouring the charge. And as the crane draws near, Note that the men actually handling the metal are either sheltered high up on the crane in the cab or operate electrical controls across the floor. There goes the charge, 50 tons of white hot liquid metal heated to approximately 2,800 degrees Fahrenheit. Hazardous? Frightful danger in this job? Not at all. Millions of dollars have been spent by modern steel mills of America for safety. Devices are employed which not only protect the worker from molten metal, from metallic dust and from flying chips, but also from human carelessness. The of steel production has made work simpler and safer. Men are not doing dangerous jobs that the machine can do more safely but more men and more competent men are required to control the machine. And the safety achievement of the steel industry is a high tribute to the intelligence of these men who work in the mills. Like good cooks, they must know the temperature of the brew, and they measure it on an optical parameter while it boils in a white hot pool as big as a fair sized room. And like good cooks, they even take several samples of the brew using a long handled small ladle to pick up enough liquid steel to cast a test ingot. It congeals almost instantly and is soon dumped out and handled quite readily. When it is cooled, it will go to the metallurgical laboratory for a thorough but quick examination before the metal from which it was taken is drawn off to be made into steel. Thousands of different kinds of steels are made like this every day. Each steel, strange as it may seem, a custom-built product each different steel, the filling of a prescription, to bear certain, to be of a certain hardness, to be soft, flexible, dull, bright, to be tailor-made for each one of thousands of uses. Now they are ready to tap a big one, and they must reach across to the opposite side of the furnace to break through the clay plug tapping hole from the inside. But the place to see the spectacular part of the operation is on the other side of the open hearth furnaces where an asbestos clothed worker burns through the exterior of the clay plug tap hole with an oxygen torch. A few more ramming blows with a long tapping iron, and there she flows. 200 tons of steel produced according to specifications for one of an infinite variety of uses. Just the proper percentages of carbon and other elements are retained in every heat of steel so that it will possess the exact characteristics needed. Men on the platform will shovel in the correct amounts of Spiegel, ferromanganese, ferrosilicon, or whatever agent the metallurgical laboratory has prescribed for this particular heat of metal. Higher and higher it mounts in the great ladle, 
until the slag, the undesirable portion of the charge, rises to the top like froth and overflows to find a future usefulness as a byproduct in other lines of business. The electric crane moves into line to carry the ladle to the pouring platform where a train of cars bearing the ingot molds is waiting. When this molten metal has been poured into molds, the basic business of making steel is ended. Thereafter, it is only a matter of fashioning from the ingots the form of product desired. The steel man says that this fiery liquid freezes immediately in the mold. He means that it congeals when its temperature goes down a thousand degrees or so, and within an hour is frozen too hard on the outside for rolling. Thus, it is not of a uniform consistency. So after the molds are stripped from the ingots, weighing from five to 15 tons apiece, the huge castings are hauled away to a furnace called a soaking pit, in which they are heated until of the same temperature throughout, and which holds them at exactly the right heat for the anvil of the modern blacksmith, the rolling mill. Now this steel is fairly on its way to you, because in this one chunk of white hot metal, there may be thousands of cans, kitchen utensils, or perhaps the materials for automobile bodies, refrigerators, and innumerable things in everyday use. And this universal use of steel is possible because its cost is only two or three cents a pound, the lowest of any important metal. The wide strip continuous mill made it possible to provide sheet steel wide enough for the all steel automobile body and the one piece steel top on the models of today. It is one of the many great advances in the art of steel making, which has brought a saving to the consuming public in the form of lower prices for better steel amounting to nearly $300 million a year compared with costs of 10 years ago. Automobile users alone are saving $75 million a year. But in spite of more men are needed in the mills, and employment is now at the highest level in the industry's history. There goes that ingot you saw, now a hot slab, flattened and elongated on its way to further reduction. Now reduced by further rolling to the size of armor plate. and now becoming a huge strip, several feet wide and less than a quarter of an inch thick. It moves to the table where it will await its turn in the coiling machine. Coiled hot, it is subsequently cold rolled flat after passing through an acid cleansing bath. Two processes which vastly improve the smoothness and polish of the surface before it is cut into the lengths prescribed by the factory to which it is to be delivered. In general, only the rarer metals such as gold or platinum have ever offered much resistance to corrosive attack until the steel industry developed stainless steels which have made this metal practical for an endless variety of uses wherein it combines beauty with resistance to rust and corrosion. Look at that polish, a permanent mirror-like surface, perhaps destined for some swanky cocktail bar or the kitchen of a modern home. Here is an operation which constitutes in itself a critical test of steel, the piercing of a solid billet to form a seamless tube. And here is another interesting operation, also a critical test of steel, the making of a car wheel. The wheel must retain its specification factors of strength and ability to take it when subsequently it will be pounding over the rails. On another mill, a big ingot begins to take form with a first rough rolling, becoming elongated as it passes through another roll, and then assuming a familiar shape as we see the outline of an H column, destined for some skyscraper or perhaps a great steel bridge. The operators of the mill, up there above it, and completely shut off from the heat of that white hot steel, turn it, spin it around, roll it by pressing buttons or throwing levers, and finally deliver it at the far end of the mill, 
a completely finished job. Steels pass through various mill processes or combinations of processes in order to make them suited to a wide variety of uses. In any giant ladle of molten metal, there may be steel that is destined to defeat time and distance, to provide the framework of mighty buildings, and to enter into the daily life of every citizen in thousands of things that provide comfort and convenience with economy. The call for steel from every section of America is a demand for a basic material without which life and living standards as we know them today would be impossible. Steel has kept pace with and anticipated the increasing needs of the nation. Men and steel provide a nation with its comforts, its luxuries, and its progress. <laughs>